Okay. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. This program is part of the Beyond the Library series. Beyond the Library and Cary Library's Museum Pass program is sponsored by the Friends of Cary Library. Cary Library has 23 discounted passes to a variety of wonderful places. Check with your library for more information on their Museum Pass program. I would also like to thank the libraries in Belmont, Tewksbury, Wellesley, Wayland, the Peabody Institute in Danvers, and the Cary Regional Library in North Carolina, which is Anders' hometown library, for partnering with us on this program. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A or chat, and Anders will answer them at the end of the program. Tonight, Anders Gyllenhaal will walk through highlights of his new book, A Wing and a Prayer, The Race to Save Our Vanishing Birds, which he co-authored with his wife, Beverly. Unfortunately, Beverly is unable to join us this evening. And then we'll have time for questions. Copies of the author's book is available for purchase through Porter Square Books. I will add the link to the chat. You can also borrow copies from the library. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Anders was an investigative reporter at the Miami Herald, then went on to lead newsrooms in Raleigh, Minneapolis, Miami, and Washington. He's long been active in journalism circles, serving on the board of the Pulitzer Prizes, Society of Newspaper Editors, and Journalism Funding Partners. Welcome, Anders. Thank you for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you so much, Helen, and and thanks everybody uh, for for tuning in. Um, this evening, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to talk with you about our our book, um, our our travels, uh, our photography, which I'll be sharing a lot of, and and our stories um, about birds, which is our very favorite talk. I'm I'm sorry that Beverly's not here. I'll be playing her role as well as as mine and doing the best I can with that. Um, so this book is about the the passionate cast of characters, and that includes scientists and birders and wildlife experts and hunters and ranchers and philanthropists who are working to save birds at what I think everyone knows is a really fragile time. So we're in this extraordinary juncture because there are two opposing forces that are at work at the same time when it comes to birds. And one is this enormous pressure that's eroded, as you probably are aware, more than half the species in North America, put a lot of pressure on birds, and we'll talk about how and why that's happening. But at the same time, the other force, there is this whole series of, of responses to those pressures, innovative ideas and in conservation, um, you know, a lot of really promising and fascinating technologies, a long list of, of really interesting uh, rescue missions all across the hemisphere. So the technology uh, of birds is advancing at this kind of head spinning and really encouraging pace at the same time as there's new ideas emerging basically and and how we can coexist with birds at a time of a lot of environmental disruption and that's why we we call this in the, in in the book and the title a race because you know which of these two primary forces are going to prevail and after talking with more than 300 people and the work we've done, uh, it, it we came away thinking that it will be decided in the very near future, over the next decade or so. Uh, Elizabeth Gray, who is the Audubon, the National Audubon Society CEO, put it this way, we have about a decade to get this right. So Beverly and I aren't, you know, aren't experts. Um, we're probably not even the best birders on, on, the, on the call tonight, but what we are and have been for our careers are, are, are journalists, storytellers. And what we wanted to do was to try to translate, you know, the, the breadth of what we found um, in a way that would really resonate with people. You know, obviously we and many of you I, I know have been, you know, captivated by birds, the awe of their um, amazing mechanics and their beauty and the critical roles they play. So sort of starting out here, I want to, emphasize um, something that I think we all, all already know, but that birds provide amazing services uh, to on, on this earth. You know, they are, in effect, the workhorses uh, for nature. Uh, 
Um, hummingbirds are a great example of the pollination role that birds play. Uh, hummingbirds uh, pollinate more than 8,000 different species of plants and flowers. And of course, birds consume tons of insects. The recent study showed, this is an amazing figure, that they consume more than 500 tons of insects a year. And those are insects that are not now uh, you know, biting you. Of course, the vultures and, and other raptors play a role that's terribly important, not a very appealing one, but they, they, they consume nature's refuse, a, a terribly important role when you put it all together. Um, and of course, birds um, collect seeds and spread around uh, the results of seeds, which basically build our forests. Um, so there's all these really important roles that, that are at work that I think we often will lose sight of. And one of the reasons for why we should care about birds. That's kind of the ground floor, and we'll talk about some of the other reasons as we go. Beverly and I got hooked on birds you know, more than about 12 years ago. We happened to be living in a, in a condo, condo down uh, downtown Washington, and we started to realize we needed to get out of the city. Uh, and on weekends, we would go out to the Eastern Shore or the Shenandoah Valley and, and camp. And we, you know, obviously, uh, had, had known birds growing up. We knew what were, you know, uh, birds from bluebirds to, uh, uh, this is a female cardinal, of course, um, owls. We recognize all the main players, but we didn't really know all that much about birds until we started getting out and traveling. And we really became, you know, obsessed with them. We would track them and I would start taking pictures. I've always been a photographer. So I, I, I love to try to catch photos like this one uh, of, of a barred owl. And um, and and so we gradually got more and more knowledge about uh, 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 about what the birds were out there and became fascinated by the research and the technology behind it. And that's what led us uh, to to this project. Uh, we started writing for newspapers and magazines for a couple of years as our work, our full time work began to slow down. We started a website. It's called FlyingLessons.us. What we're learning from the birds, and you kind of can get the concept of what that is. Birds have a lot to teach us. As we wrote more uh, for newspapers from the Tampa Bay Times to the Washington Post, that led us uh, to, to, to this book. And one of the you know, underlying themes that the book um, explores is the relationship between people and, and birds. And there was an unavoidable conclusion that we reached after uh, this work and talking to so many people, I think is kind of obvious in a way that Americans love birds. We dearly love birds until they get in our way. And if you look back over the last more than a century uh, of history of sort of North America's birdscape, it's swung back and forth. This is something you probably are aware of uh, as well, but it's worth sort of setting that that on, on the foundation of our, our discussion, whole segments of species <clears throat> over time have been threatened and saved back and forth. You know, uh, and, and the important thing is that each time there's been deep and uh, uh, you, know, you know lasting threats to birds, Americans have stepped forward and put into place the kind of things that protect them. And that goes all the way back to uh, the 1900s, the turn of the century, the 1900s, when we were slaughtering birds for their feathers for women's hats, uh, you know, birds from herons to, to egrets uh, to spoonbills were nearly wiped out until we put into place uh, laws that 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 protected migratory birds, and all of those those three species now uh, are are coming back and and. Um, and are doing uh, much better. Then in the 30s, uh, ducks and geese were threatened by the uh, the drought of the Dust Bowl, Bowl years and and uh, and overhunting. And a group of hunters, mostly uh, led by uh, uh, some uh, leading business folks, got together, formed organizations like Ducks Unlimited, and created a whole system for taxing ammunition, guns, bows and arrows. It funds conservation, and this ended up being the most significant conservation effort that that exists uh, uh, to 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 this day. And then, in um, the '60s and '70s, we realized, following the the Rachel Carson Silent Spring book, 
that DDT was in, infused across the environment and threatening birds like the, the bald eagle, the osprey, um, the, the California condor, <clears throat> we put into place the Environmental Protection Agency. We passed the Endangered Species Act. And the whole environmental awareness began to grow at that time as a result of it. So time and time again, there have been uh, uh, real challenges for our bird life as the country grew and developed and we consumed an awful lot of the land and habitat, it pushed birds into difficult places. And that's where we are again today. Um, the crisis, we can call it that, is, is different and deeper than in the past. We recently witnessed the most significant avian research in decades when a group of scientists uh, from seven different organizations led by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology up in upstate New York and American Bird Conservancy in Washington and several others, they figured out for the first time how to count birds, how to figure out how many birds do we have in North America. Before that, it was always rough guesswork. Um, if you think about it, birds are uh, always moving and they're mostly trying to stay away from us, so they're difficult to count. And it was always just a rough estimate until 2019 when they figured out how to use a combination of new technologies, including weather radar, that in addition to being able to see rainfall, can can be tuned to see birds moving over the course of uh, of the sky, and and that combined with traditional bird counts that are done every spring, was a way to figure out how many birds there are. And they figured out that the total number of birds was about breeding birds. Uh, this is at the core of the bird uh, landscape was about 10 million uh, at its height in the 1970s, but that a third of that population had been wiped out over less than a lifetime, so over 50 years. And this answered you know, a lot of questions about the specifics, where was it happening, what were hit the hardest, et cetera, et cetera. But it also raised all kinds of questions, particularly in our minds. We had already been pretty deep into this. We had heard about this research coming. We had spent time at Cornell uh, as they got ready to uh, release the results of this. And what we thought needed to be answered was, you know, what what all is being done about this? What can be done? What's you know what's not being done that might be done? Where is is this leading? There's there's so much written. Uh, about birds. It's it's an area where the library is full of books on birds, and many of them about individual iconic species, a couple of new ones out on, on owls, wonderful books, uh, books on uh, an eagle just came out last year, really wonderful, a lot of guidebooks. But what we didn't find was a book that tried to look at, well, what's happening with the overall population? What's going on with, with birds and what's the outlook? So that's what we wanted to uh, put together in uh, A Wing and a Prayer, which ended up being uh, purchased by Simon and & Schuster and, of course, came out in the spring. We realized that the best way to research this book was to get out onto the front lines of what was being done. We happened to have a 23-foot, um, oops, I, I meant to show you that. That's the uh, graph that shows the drop of the number of birds, 2.9 billion birds lost, about a third of the population. So we have this uh, this Airstream trailer that we packed up and turned into an office as a way to be on the front lines. I have to say this makes it look a lot better than it actually is. This is a wide angle lens. A friend of ours took this photo. Uh, it, it looks a, a lot roomier than the reality, uh, but it was a great experience to be out in the middle of where all the action is. We started at our home in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. We traveled. Uh, down the, the coast to Florida, across the country to Wyoming and to California. We parked the trailer, flew to Hawaii. We'll talk a little bit about Hawaii's story. Uh, and then uh, eventually crossed back across the country. And then we spent time in Washington with the you know, sort of authorities there. We traveled to South America as well for that part of the story. And and and, uh, and, and we found so many different stories that give you a sense of where the rescue of North America's birds and, and is taking place and, and what they are up against and really how, you know, how fascinating and complex this work is. And most importantly, the question we're trying to answer in this book is, 
you know, what are the prospects for having impact? So I want to take you to just a couple of, of, of stories that we tell. Um, this is the Florida grasshopper sparrow, the target of a fascinating and really desperate scientific intervention after its numbers dropped just to 22 breeding pairs uh, in the Florida grasslands, not far from Disney World. Uh, this would be the second sparrow that was facing extinction in that same area over the course of a couple of decades. So a group of scientists got together and said, what can we do to try to restore the species? And they figured out how to breed the birds in a kind of a laboratory setting, raise them up uh, and teach them how to be birds, how to sing, how to watch out for hawks and all the things that birds have to do. And then they release them back onto the prairie. Uh, and uh, this is the group of scientists uh, heading out there with boxes uh, that held the birds and they released them uh, into the prairie starting about four years ago. And gradually, this population has become, has begun to come back and it has now doubled, which is still not a huge number of birds, but it feels stabilized to these scientists. And it looks like that this bird has stands a good chance of, of surviving. It's a very inspiring story, but it's also a troublesome one because so it's an illustration of so so much of our effort is going to birds that are on the very the final stages of their life, the, the near near uh, extinction, which is where the costs are highest and the the odds are longest. And this is not necessarily where we should be putting all our effort. We need to figure out ways the book explores this question as people talk about this, how to move this whole focus upstream to an earlier time to try to protect birds. So that's an interesting story. I'm just giving you a real quick synopsis of it. Here's another bird that uh, is a symbolic bird in, in any ways. This, this is Be Beverly's favorite bird. She would be doing this part. as a, She calls it a little puff ball of a bird. It's a cerulean warbler and we followed this little guy on its migration it's one of the third of the birds that that migrate uh, up and, and down the hemisphere uh, each year many of these birds are spread across the forest lands of Appalachian mountains then they go down across the Gulf of Mexico uh, into Colombia Ecuador as far south as Peru it can be a two or three thousand uh, uh, mile journey so the the ceruli is it, cerulean is one of the, sort of the, the symbols of this. Um, here are some photos of some of the other migratory birds that uh, you can run into uh, uh, up moving up and down the coast. The prothonotory is my, that's, can I move this uh, so you can see the, I guess I, yeah, here we go. Let's see if we can get that out of the way. Is that a visible, is that better there? Okay. Um, the prothonotory uh, warbler, it just uh, doesn't seem to like that change. Let's see if we can figure out what we're doing here. Maybe uh, put this up here. Okay. Uh, the uh, gross beak, another uh, migrator, hooded warbler, um, the painted bunting, a sort of a Rembrandt uh, of a bird. So these birds uh, face some of the most difficult, most arduous uh, travels of all birds because as they travel across all these, as many as 12 countries in some cases, each of which has its own policies, often they don't work very well together. And in many ways, we look at the, these these birds as, as, as uh, sort of caught between uh, the different forces. And that's been one of the areas where more um, uh, birds have been lost than anywhere else for that uh, th those reasons. It makes the work between North and South America especially important. Our history has not been good of coordinating and working together. The US has many more resources, far more research. South America has far more birds, almost three, more than three times the number of birds. Here are some of those amazing birds that the migratory birds will meet when they get down across uh, uh, the border is a tanagers. That was a toucan, um, a flower piercer, which is a tanager as well. Look at that red eye against the blue plumage. And, you know, all kinds of hummingbirds. Um, this one with a tail that, what is that? Three times as long as the bird itself. The the part of the story we, we try to tell uh, out, out of South America is that 
th these two halves of the hemisphere really need to work together uh, if we're going to make make progress because so many of the birds are in the south and the migratory birds are are so very important so that's an, a really imp important piece of the story one of the challenges uh for all birds of course is how can they thrive in a you know ever diminishing chunk of habitat and that's the challenge of this fascinating project of the involving the florida scrub jay Th this bird has um lost about 90 percent of its population uh over the recent decades and that's partly because mostly because 90 percent of the habitat which is the inland dry arid territory that they like has been taken over for homes and businesses and theme parks etc so the challenge that a group of, of scientists at the archbold biological station near the center of the state in central florida is you know how to make the most of the land that remains how to connect corridors between chunks of land so that the birds can move and and breed and be successful and how to make that that land a, a, as conducive as possible to protect birds, which is good for everything that's on it. So they have been tracking these birds around the clock with with, with a tele system of telemetry that allows them to look at every move they make and figure out what will make them the most successful. And just in the last year or so, have come up with the different ways of how to protect the land as much as possible that remains and the, the 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 population of the scrub jay seems to be stabilizing. There's a lot of work to do. Florida is now the third most populated state, right? Booming uh, a, a place full of of development that pushes uh, wildlife to the side. But it's also a state that's been very aggressive with with its environmental protection, where it does have land. The Florida scrub jay is an example of that. The next bird we want to talk about is the. California spotted owl. Um, and it is the subject of the world's largest project using sound to try to rescue birds. <clears throat> the, the spotted owl, which you remember is a, a relative of the Northern spotted owl that had uh, generated so much controversy in Washington and Oregon a generation ago and ended up huge battles over the lumber industry and the owl, both of which mostly lost out um, is the sp California spotted owl is spread across the heights of the Sierra Nevadas in uh, eastern California. A very remote land, the bird's population had been dwindling, and this, the project put on by the U.S. Forestry Service was to figure out how can they figure out where the birds are and try to protect them from a number of different predators, including barred owls moving in from, from, from the east. So the solution was to put up recorders across millions of acres and use artificial intelligence to process the, the recordings that they, they take that enable them to map where these birds are. None of this would have been possible without advances uh, in, from the internet to, to be able to sort through photos uh, and, and other um, data on the internet that's now used to look through the reams and reams of information that they pull out on where these owls are. It's a really powerful new tool that's being used in, in many parts of the world that are, that are most remote. And so far, they're starting to figure out how to stabilize uh, things for the spotted owl. There's a long way to go on this bird as well, uh, but it, it, it's looking very promising. And the interesting part is it's an example of the technology that's having uh, you know a lot of, of of impact. The most you know unusual, uh, I guess, is fair to say, conservation project in the country is in uh, Hawaii. Um, you know, the researchers there are trying to save um, the last of the native forest birds, like these the iwi uh, and the akiapa lao and the palila. Uh, whoops, did I yeah? Oh, the Palila and the Ikiapa Alao. These birds are, um, you know, unique, beautiful. Look at the beak on it on this bird, designed specifically to drill into the the bark that it lives on and and pull out larvae. And that's 
That's a beak that um, is, is not unlike some of the others you see on these Hawaii birds. The problem for these birds is that an avian malaria brought with all kinds of other invasive species that have overwhelmed the Hawaiian islands is spreading among these birds and, and killing them off. Uh, the last 15 of the 17 honey creepers that remain are threatened by this. The solution is to, to develop a, 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 a brand of mosquito in the laboratory that can be spread across the inlands of the Hawaii, key Hawaiian islands that will mate with wild mosquitoes and act as a kind of birth control uh, to try to prevent the spread of malaria. They're just starting this project uh, this year and trying to you know, desperately save uh, the last of, of these birds. Hawaii um, has already lost about two thirds of the original 140 or so native birds. And so this is a really important sort of stopgap measure, quite an extreme one. Uh, we call it a moonshot in telling the story in this book because there is a lot, uh, a, a lot like a moonshot about this, but it does seem to have promise. And it's one thing to, to, to watch. Uh, it's a story to watch if, if you're, you can uh, because it kind of gets into the whole question, not that this is genomics, but genomics is the next stage that's awaiting how to try to confront um, some of the challenges that these birds are facing. The last story we wanted to, to share uh, is uh, about the red cockaded woodpecker. It's a bird that looked doomed um, just a, a few decades ago. Um, but what came to rescue none, them was none other than the U.S. military. What's happened is that as the country has developed military bases all across the, the U.S., have become like islands of an, an undisturbed land, and and as a result, hum, home to some 500 species of rare uh, wildlife, birds, insects, plants. Uh, and 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 in the case of the red cockaded woodpecker was uh, gradually being lost from the area in the Southeast US, 15 different bases uh, that had these and was gradually losing them. You can imagine that military uh, commanders had very little interest in playing nursemaid to a bunch of birds, but the law said that you have to protect an endangered bird. The bird was decreed endangered and uh, there was a lot of push and pull uh, in this, including one point where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife halted uh, training on the uh, on the world's largest military base, Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty, uh, because they were disregarding all, all the rules. That caused uh, the Department of Defense to say, we're going to take this on and get it right, and they have. Um, it's one of the most impressive uh, examples of thoughtful research that's being done. And in the case of the uh, red cockaded woodpecker, there's plenty of challenges for why this is tough. The bird is the pickiest, the pickiest bird you could ever hope to meet. It builds its cavities in, in, in very strict <clears throat> number of pine trees that have to be 80 to 100 years old at dead, but not quite dying, but not quite dead. And, 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 and the interior has to be rotting for them to be happy. And so since there are fewer and fewer trees and it takes them years, almost 10 years to build their, their cavities because of the nature of these trees, they were in deep trouble. The military looked into this, studied it and came up with a solution to build a man-made cavity that can be installed in a tree in, uh, in a single afternoon and enable them to put up housing all across these bases. The, the birds flock to it and they're gradually uh, recovering uh, and they had been in, in the endangered list. They're being moved uh, to, to threaten uh, 25 years uh, ahead of schedule. And the message here is that if the military can save birds in the middle of busy training bases, full of bombing ranges, airports, this is something that it can be done elsewhere far more easily. So the military is a model that we, we think can be held up and an and, 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 and example of what, what can be done when we want to. So the second half of, of the book, um, we look at the broader issues in, involving the future of birds 
in North America. Um, you know, what's going on, <laughs> excuse me, what's going on that can help not just individual species, but, you know, the wider expanse of birds. And there's good and also some bad news on, on this front. We devote a whole chapter to a group of ranchers, skip that part there, there a bunch of, of ranchers and farmers who have figured out how to make room for birds in a way that's not only good for the wildlife, but leads to a more productive and profitable ranch. This is a family that's working out of uh, Southeast Kansas and has figured out how to, in effect, coexist with birds. And that's that's part of a growing realization that if we're gonna save our birds, agriculture, which of course has changed a huge chunk of, of, uh, of the natural land is gonna have to be a part of it. A growing number of ranchers and farmers are recognizing this and they're figuring out how to do this. Another really interesting project we, we go into uh, in, in great depth was uh, started by the same scientists who figured out that we'd lost a third of our birds. Uh, they got together, led by uh, Georgetown University's Pete Mara here, and and said, we, we need to do more than just report the news of the losses. What can be done? Their message is that research needs to be properly funded and very practical, and there needs to be fundamental changes in the way that research is being done. We're in this time of just tremendous knowledge and very powerful tools in the technology that we've gone through very quickly here, but has had you know a, a, a enormous impact in understanding them. How does that can that be applied? So that the group that they've formed called Road to Recovery has gathered a whole group of of scientists to work together to try to move upstream and work on birds before they get into into the deep trouble that you know we we see on so many species. Uh, John Fitzpatrick, who's the director emeritus uh, at the Cornell Lab, that's Beverly, and doing an interview uh, with, with him is part of that operation as well. Another really big model that, um, that can help lead the way uh, are ducks and, and geese, um, because as we mentioned very briefly, uh, there's a system put into place since the 1930s that has figured out how to preserve breeding grounds, migratory lanes, and, and habitat for ducks and geese. And this is, this is funded by uh, 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 the, the laws that have gone to place, as well as the duck stamps that enable uh, these birds to get what they need. Now, these, the, the, the bulk of our species of birds in North America are in decline. Ducks and geese during that same period of time, their population has risen 56%. So it shows you that even in the busy, busy areas where ducks are, which are, you know, tend to be in many of the wetlands areas on the coast and, and, and inland, if you can save ducks and geese, we ought to be able to save other birds. There's a lot behind this, including why isn't there a method for funding songbirds that maybe you could tax bird seed. Four billion dollars in bird seed is sold every year, or binoculars. Um, this has been an idea that's been kicking around and it's now is probably a good time for, for, for that to be um, moved forward. There's also not such good news uh, on, the, on, the, on the broader front, of course, and you know what stands in the way of progress. And at the top of the list is the uh, you know, the continued loss of, of habitat, followed by uh, uh, um, you know, persistent ambivalence the country has always had about devoting resources to wildlife management and struggles over economic interest and conservation needs. And the fact is that our federal and, and state conservation system is not keeping up with the pace of these losses. Um, it's pretty clear that the, the, the leadership for this is not going to come from our political leaders. You know, on the federal level, there's just uh, too much intransigence. I cannot reach agreement on on what uh, what is what needs to be done. There is a tremendously powerful and very positive uh, model that has moved through the legislature called Restoring America's Wildlife Act that would provide a lot of the very fundings that it needed. Passed the House, stalled in the Senate. A great example of 
a bipartisan effort that came through 10 years of work to prepare this and just can't get over the finish line. An example of uh, what ought to be pushed and, and how, how, with how much some of these solutions are within reach. The leadership may not come from politics, but there's a lot of leadership coming from other places. Um, uh, nonprofits, the Cornell Lab, American Bird Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, Nature Conservancy, are, are showing all kinds of ways of working together. Um, you know, philanthropies are, are increasingly recognizing that the, the challenges of climate change, a lot of the things that need to be put into place to try to deal with that, protecting land, uh, are, are good for birds. So there's, I think also we can see an increasingly uh, a pub, a level higher level of public interest in birds. During the pandemic, uh, uh, people sort of discovered birds. M millions of new birders were added to the ranks. And when the pandemic has moved on, uh, those birders have, have stuck with it. It's a very powerful uh, force if, 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 we, if it will get behind uh, uh, some of the neat, uh, things that need to be uh, pushed through. And a great example of this is uh, some of the citizen science projects that are out there that are aimed at birders that allow you by using such apps as eBird uh, or the Merlin Bird ID app to keep track of the birds you see, that data is then shared to researchers who can use that, that information on where the birds are, how they're moving to formulate effective conservation. So Beverly and I, we, we end up feeling mostly hopeful uh, that this country will once again take advantage of the, this unique moment that we're in, you know, a time when the, the knowledge of birds is deeper than it's ever been before and the, the powers of avian research are accelerating. The public needs to speak louder on this. Uh, but when, you know, the deeper you get into birds, and that's part of the, the solution uh, and wh why we wanted to uh, to tell these stories, the, the more you get into birds and, and see their, their, their beauty and amazing uh, mechanics, I think the more we can appreciate them and the more we'll support the kind of conservation notions that, that are needed at this time. So let me stop there and, um, and, and open things up to uh, any questions questions that we have. Helen, do you want me to, to look through the... Uh... Sure. So um, thank you, Anders. The photos in your presentation are beautiful. And I'm sure like there will be lots of questions on how you took those photos. But I yeah. want to um, start with, um, as you mentioned, you and Beverly traveled more than 25,000 miles across the Americas. Can you share some of your favorite anecdotes? Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, the as I mentioned kind of briefly, the, the, the reason we wanted to get out there was because we felt like being on the front lines was, was the key. So uh, we ended up, you know, uh, uh, camping right on the edge of San Diego Bay when we were out there looking, working with the San Diego Zoo uh, Alliance, which is doing all kinds of really interesting work, including on uh, condors, uh, all the way across to, uh, to, to Florida. Um, the, I'll tell you one one interesting story. We we came away uh, at one point. Um, we thought we wanted to dig into the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is you you will probably recall uh, it is it hadn't actually been seen since 1944. But many people believe this huge woodpecker is still out there across the South. So uh, this luckily became a new controversy while we were writing the book because uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife announced that it was going to declare the bird extinct. We got uh, together with the most aggressive of the researchers, a group of scientists working out of a secret location in Louisiana, and we went out with them. Uh, and, and the lesson from this, I will, spoiler alert, we did not find the bird, but we, we learned a lot about what it takes to try to protect and, and, and save birds. And in this case, we spent a lot of time uh, walking through the, the swamps. We always seem to have the wrong shoes on. And that was certainly true when we went out the first day uh, with the ivory build group called the Principalis Project. 
we we got um t- got together. We started out. We had you know normal sort of walking boots on. We started to make our way through the swampland, and the leader of this, who happens to be the head of the uh, uh, National Aviary out of Pittsburgh, he had big chaps on covering and uh, big rubber boots, and we started to walk through this muck. And he said, you know, there's a lot of water moccasins here. Um, and uh, uh, it so happened that I was right behind him, and Beverly was behind me, and she, so she was third in line. And 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 he said to us, he said, you know, the thing is that usually the third person in line that gets bit. So Beverly quickly jumped in front of me and put me back in the third. She was willing to sacrifice me. We didn't have any issues with, with that, but we did really come away from that and walking up and down the Hawaiian mountains, for instance. Uh, in, in deserts, on islands, with a real appreciation for how uh, hard it is in many of these cases, remote places, arduous places, for people who are who are doing this work. It was also very beautiful. Uh, the uh, the spotted owl uh, photos you saw uh, came out of Yosemite National uh, Park, uh, way up in, in those mountains. We traipsed all, all the way up, uh, up high elevations to, to see that bird and to get a sense of the bioacoustics. Those are the audio boxes that are spread across there. Just spectacular land uh, things to, to see. So we, we, we had a chance to really you know, take in the country as well as, as so many different species, but come away with a deep appreciation for the people that are on the front lines and doing this work. Thank you. So we have some questions. How can you change the Google algorithms that only show how to get rid of barn swallows? I've seen their numbers decrease and each year have less successful nests due to human destruction and crows predating. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I'm not sure that 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 the, the Google algorithms are the issue there. I mean, barn swallows, like a, a lot of birds, are uh, insectivores, uh, so they're dealing with the loss of insects, uh, and that you know is basically their food supply. The issues around um, insects is an enormously complicated one. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of factors, and nobody agrees completely on what's at the heart of this. Um, you know, we talked a, a little earlier about the 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 decision to ban DDT, which proved to be uh, it, you know, is destructive to the eggs of all kinds of species, from bald eagles to um, whooping cranes to uh, con- condors. We're, we we banned uh, DDT, and those birds all came back. Now we are faced with uh, a whole new generation of, of, of pesticides, the neonicotinoids, that um, there's a lot of dispute about whether or not that is having an impact on birds but the research has not been the st- and not met the standard that it needs to to know whether or not this is a contributing factor. So there's a lot of things that uh, that pesticides are are at fault with when it comes to what, what comes to the loss of insects and you know the the, the natural system. Uh, we need birds. We need insects. We need larger you know uh, wildlife. It all fits together. It's a great big. Um, uh, codependent situation, and, and when one piece of this gets pulled out, uh, it is um, going to have impact. So the solution here is to understand what's happening with pesticides and and deal with them and confront. You know, when when the cost is too high, we're not going to stop trying to feed the world. But we, as the farmers, we talked about in in Kansas, you you can ba- you can find a balance, and that's what we probably need to be doing. Sure. And to continue that conversation, um, Tanya just asked, how do we get folks to stop spraying pesticide to herbicides everywhere? Um, and I think that's something that you can probably talk to your town about, but do you have any other recommendations? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's several layers uh, uh, of issues are at work. You can deal with it on the local level where sometimes I think the impact can be more effective the national issue really are trying to get our agencies that are responsible for this to live up to to their standards uh, and make sure that we are um, that we are using safe chemicals. Um, it's just one piece of the you know the overall the overarching issues when it comes to 
insects, but it's an important one. So uh, that would be the, the, the simple, you know, kind of quick answer to a complex question. Sure. Thank you. Um, Sarah says, have you talked with Johnny Morris uh, of Bass Pro about this conservation work? As you probably know, he is a huge proponent and supporter of conservation. Yeah. And in fact, he is part of the cause that put together the recommendations that led to restoring America's Wildlife Act. And, you know, what's so interesting about that project was, you know, it began in 2014, I think it was, um, a deep study driven by a combination of players, you know, energy companies were a part of that, uh, 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 game birds, uh, fish, f fishing institutions like his, um, along with birders and, and, and government agencies and stuff, they all got together worked on what's going to balance out this sort of out of whack funding situation when it comes to America's wildlife. Came up with this plan, worked its way through, uh, you know, from broad recommendations to specifics that went to Congress and worked their way all the way through. Now, if there was enough support for that, I think that would stand a much better chance of getting passed through the Senate. Uh, and and what does that mean? And I think there's all kinds of ways you can, uh, you know, you, uh, respond to your representatives, uh, uh, Audubon Society and American Bird Conservancy. They all make it very easy to try to let people know how you feel to support the causes that are needed. Local causes are very important. National causes are important as well. And get familiar with what 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 needs to be done uh, to try to help. Uh, I think one of the things that we came away believing when we write about this in the book is that it's really interesting to compare hunters uh, and, and other game bird uh, enthusiasts and how uh, tough they are when they're protecting their interests. They don't, they, they, they know how to get things through Congress. Birders tend to be more passive and, uh, and don't and haven't been organized and haven't pushed for the things that that are important to them. It would be great, and we raised this question in the book, if the two of them would work more together. It's kind of a dichotomy there that's been in place for many years, but there's many intersecting interests. So we need a more of a hunter's attitude among the, the birders to try to get things done uh, and to push through the things that need to be done. Um, you know, polls show that the vast majority of Americans support conservation in general. It's just a matter of putting together the specifics that push forward, you know, th these details. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to go back and touch a little bit um, upon the, um, the bird loss statistics. Can you talk about the grassroots efforts like the North American Breeding Bird Survey and how those yeah. efforts contributed to the um, three billion birds lost statistics that you talked about. Yeah, it's really it's really fascinating. Um, it goes back to the 1960s and 70s when uh, during the same time that the realization came over the country that we would were losing birds, that DDT was uh, infused across the land. U.S. Fish and Wildlife launched its research. Uh, uh, wing uh, outside of Washington um, and began to figure out how can we learn about birds. And the first step that they they did was to to uh, work with a group of volunteers, um, expert bird um, people who can who can hear bird songs and identify birds. They set up a system where every spring a group of these thousands of people are spread out along the same routes and listen and count the birds. For years, they just collected this, this data, but as decades went by, that was possible to, uh, to calculate how, this, how overall populations were changing and shifting. And the Breeding Bird Survey was the foundation uh, of the Three Billion Bird Report, but it wasn't enough to be specific. They had to overlay, for instance, that weather radar in order to kind of double check what they were seeing from a, a much more uh, you know subtle count that that exists in the breeding bird survey. Uh, so when they put all that together, 
that's how they came up with the the, the population numbers that uh, you know surprised even uh, e even the specialists who had been watching birds all this time because it was so specific. The number is a very powerful one, three billion birds, and it really caught a lot of people's attention, and I, I think has helped to elevate this this cause uh, a, a good bit because uh, of the detail that it offers. Into um, apps like Merlin and eBirds help scientists track the bird population? Because I know when I use the app, it asks yeah. me to share my location. Right. Um, so eBird and, and Merlin Bird ID are, are two different uh, apps that uh, that Cornell has developed over the last 20 years in eBird's case and really the last 10 years in Merlin's case. What eBird does is it enables birders to record what birds they see and the reason it asks you for location because it wants to know where those birds are, it's not asking that to to um, to pass along the information. It's automatically shared with Cornell, and and with with nine hundred thousand birders around the world using eBird, all of a sudden the avalanche of data of where birds are, where they're moving, is available for research purposes. As we as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, Merlin bird ID is, is a different animal. It en enables um, people to uh, I uh, identify the birds around them. It, record, it it does it three different ways. One, it asks a series of questions of you. What, what's the bird look like? What color is uh, its plumage? What is it doing? And that gives you a list of possible birds. And then about a year ago, they added the uh, sound ID, which basically is your phone using its... Uh, uh, microphone to listen to the birds. The development of bird identification using sound has advanced to the point that it's almost always correct. So in, on your phone, you will see a list of the birds that are singing and they will light up when the bird is actually singing at that moment. It will tell you what the birds are. And this is a, a way both for people to learn bird sounds, to, to identify birds, not just the ones they see, but the ones that they can't see because they're hidden away and get a sense of what birds are around you and to elevate <laughs> an awareness about birds. And it's working uh, in, in, in a really amazing way. Uh, uh, the, the Merlin bird ID what, what has gone from a, a kind of a bird guide to this really powerful tool uh, that is with, with high accuracy levels that is uh, being embraced, I think downloaded 15 million times uh, uh, in the last couple of, of, of uh, years as it, as it spread. So both of them together, I think uh, both collect data that can be used for conservation and, and, and also help us to understand birds in ways that we otherwise uh, wouldn't. So they've been very powerful and they're spreading you know, all around the world. So, uh, you know, the U.S. leads the way in usage, but right behind that is Europe. Uh, India has been a big leader. A lot of South American countries are embracing these tools. Some in Africa, um, Australia. So the world is is following in the same path that we are in trying to understand birds better. And then, of course, consequently to figure out what to do about the losses. Um, I want to get to some of the questions that we have um, from our attendees. How are wind farms affecting birds, particularly migration? Yeah, this is um, a growing issue because, as we all, all know, uh, turbines are, are expected to be expanded greatly. And this is a challenge. Uh, wind uh, energy is going to be important, and it helps the overall cause, uh, environmental cause, certainly. Uh, at the same time, we don't have, as a country, a comprehensive policy for where to place them, how to avoid uh, co colliding with the migratory paths that birds use. So there needs to be uh, a, a, a system for uh, permitting and, and thinking about where these farms should go and where, where they shouldn't go. We're in the early stages of this, and so you know the arguments are, well, we need to know more, but we're also going to be putting up all kinds of turbines 
in, in, on land and, and, and on sea. And now is the time to get ahead of that. I don't think anybody is going to argue uh, reasonably that there shouldn't be turbines in place. It's more a matter of how do we figure out where they should be. Um, the numbers are somewhat helpful when we looked at you know what what's causing <laughs> bird deaths. You know, feral cats are far and away the leader. Two point four billion birds die at the hands and claws of feral cats. Big issue, really important one, possible to to confront. A lot of opposition to that as well. Collisions with buildings, particularly high-rise buildings, about a billion birds uh, die every year from, from that. The latest numbers on turbines are in the millions. So it's a much smaller issue uh, from, from initial you know, counting of birds but it's going to grow. And so it, it needs to be a part of uh, what we confront if we want to keep our birds, uh, you know, if we want to protect our birds from the things that are, are causing them. But put put them in, in that kind of a priority list. That is not yet, but will become a, a growing issue. Thank you. You do talk quite a bit about the, the laundry list of man-made hazards on page 39 of your book. But um, with so many threats contributing to the loss of birds, what small actions can we take closer to home to help? Yeah, and that and that's how we end, end the book. There's an afterword that lists, you know, all kinds of things that people can do, um, and and it's and it, it and there's much there. Uh, many of the things that we're confronted with today uh, that are that are challenges are tough to respond to. Birds are not in that category. You know, you can uh, put in native plants in your backyard, which helps birds and put up bird feeders. You can avoid pesticides. You can support the groups that are that are working on behalf of birds, push for these initiatives, some of which we've mentioned uh, that that are helpful to birds. You, you know, the high rise buildings are uh, the biggest problems. Uh, and yet uh, um, glass windows in your home can be an issue for birds. You can turn off your lights during high migration uh, periods uh, when birds are flying, many of them at night get confused by lights. Um, cities can have lights out. About 30 cities are doing that now, but not nearly enough. These are Those are some of the easy things that can be done without consequences. The lights out campaigns, when you think about migration in the fall and in the spring, just a couple of peak weeks where that is at its height, and, and that's when the, the lights out can make uh, a, a real difference. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. Uh, and I think, you know, playing a role with Merlin and eBird help get you deeper into the, the bird world and also open up, uh, you know, a sense of where birds are and what's going on and who you're hearing uh, are, are wonderful ways of playing a role. Thank you, Anders. And so we have time for one more question. So I want to jump back to the question about how did you take these beautiful pictures? Because we have oh, lots of compliments yeah. about how um, right. beautiful they look. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, the photography is uh, is a, a love of, of mine. It also allows you to, you know, to watch birds as they forage and fly and and so trying to capture the these photos and and they're particularly uh all across our website flyinglessons.us um is full full of the bird photos uh you know i think that photography has advanced enormously for bird photographers and you know you see almost as many uh cameras out there as you will on binoculars these days because the the the, the art of trying to capture bird photos is both very fulfilling, but, you know, they're shared in all sorts of ways. Our website, other people have websites. It shows you those birds in a way that you can't really see with the naked eye. So I, I think about the power of photography, particularly the real professionals. I mean, I'm a hobbyist and I appreciate the, the kind words, uh, but you can also look at the, the, the true uh, uh, talented professional bird photographers books and, and those sorts of things. And that I think helps us to appreciate uh, birds as well. So all these photos that 
that I think are flooding uh, our, our our world are are helpful and and a great way to be thinking about birds. Um, so thanks for the uh, for the kind words on on the photos and and come to our website uh, and and you can sign up for. Uh, in fact, let me go back to I'll put uh, this information up here. I'm going to have to shoot down here. Excuse me. Uh, we'd we'd love to have you sign up for our our our, our uh, newsletter. Uh, here's our email as well. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have questions that we didn't cover. Um, we have a a, a Facebook site uh, site as well. And um, you know we they think the conversation is so important. Um, there's so much to learn. So these are some of the ways that we're trying to share. Uh, share stories. Uh, and the book itself is available, of course, uh, uh, online, uh, uh, Amazon, to uh, independent bookstores. Uh, many uh, bookstores across the country have still have copies. Um, came out in April. It's been out for a little while. It's a great, people tell me it's a great Christmas present. I think that's good. I like that idea. Uh, give it away if if you want to. And, uh, and please let us hear from you if you have questions to follow up. Uh, or want to join uh, our, our newsletter, we'd love that. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, uh, Anders. I had so many more questions, but we are out of time. Yeah. Um, and so thank you again. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and we look forward you to your next um, project. Thanks so much. Thank you all. It's, it's great to have a chance to commune with you and, and all the best. Uh, Here's to the birds. Thank you so much. Good night, right. everyone. Good night.